lot of letters in my life, some of them good, some of them bad, some of them excellent, tax rebates are always nice when they come through the door, um, some of them not so great, uh, my student loan getting all of my details wrong and telling me I've not been accepted, that was sad. Um, it was all a mistake, it all went out well. Um, but one of the weirdest letters I've ever received was I have in fact received hate mail. Um, before I tell you this story, I have worked through this, I am fine, that is why I am telling this story. And in fact, I tell this story often because it is one of the most ridiculous things that have happened to me. But I received a hate letter. What happened was, I was in year nine at school and I had this friendship group. And we were drifting apart. We didn't like the same things. We didn't do the same things. We were drifting apart and my friends decided that our relationship had come to an end. So what they did was they wrote me a letter explaining all the things they don't like about me. And they gave it to me. I know, it's really sad. I am okay. <laughs> um, and they just, it was one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever received. I was sat in assembly clutching this letter going, oh, no one loves me. And it was just horrible. And while I imagine most of you have never received a letter like that, I imagine most of you can understand that sometimes people say things and what they're actually saying to you is, I don't like you, I don't like this. We've all had that experience. We might have made a joke and someone rolled their eyes. We might have invited someone to something and they go, oh, that's a bit silly, isn't it? We've all had that moment where you've been told you were wrong. And it's always hard to hear. It's always hard to hear. And the thing is, 90% of that stuff isn't true, is it? When people tell you that you can't be loved, it's just not true. But as with all good lies, I watch a lot of TV and TV has told me one good thing, that all good lies have an element of truth in it. And it is true. We do sometimes do silly things. We sometimes do things that aren't good. There's a verse in Romans, um, chapter 3, verse 23, that says, uh, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's quite a lot of complicated words to basically say that we all do silly things. We all do things that just aren't great. Uh, we all do things, and not always meaning them. Sometimes you think it is a great idea, like wrestling, until you are crying, your sister has chipped her tooth and your nana is shouting at you and you realise, oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> it's not always because we did something evil. We're not all mass murderers, are we? The world would look very different if we were, but we all do things that are silly. And then the world tells you that you will never be loved and you will never be welcomed because you did that silly thing just not true because that is not the end of the chapter. The next verse says Romans 3, 24, all who have come to the Father are justified through Jesus. In year nine when I received that letter, I told all my friends and family about it because it hurt me and I was acting different because of it and they needed to know. And I told my friends and family about this, and two of my friends wrote me this letter, which I have kept to this day. It is genuinely a love letter, by all definitions. Because my friends saw what had happened to me, and their response was to say to me, No, I love you too much to let this keep happening. That is what they said to me. And Jesus, when he looked at what we'd done, what was happening to us, what's being said to us, he looks at us and goes, no, I love you too much to let this keep happening. Now the letter my friends wrote, it didn't give me a list of things to do so that no one could ever say I was silly again. It didn't tell me things that I was doing wrong that I needed to fix so that I would be universally loved. 
No. It bizarrely has a lot about iceberg lettuce in there because it to this day is my favourite food of all time. It says to me that you are very loud and that you quote books maybe a little too much. But we love that because you're you and we love you. God in this verse doesn't say, you need to do this first. I love you a little bit, but you need to do this and then I'll love you a lot. What he says is that I am justifying you. Now in this context, justify can mean a lot of things in the world. People often use it to justify bad behaviour, don't you? That's where you hear it. I did this, but it's okay because. That's not quite what justify means in this. It does mean you did silly things, but it's okay because. But it's not because of a reason you have. It's because of an external reason. It's because Jesus came down and he chooses to forgive you. He chooses to love you anyway. He chooses to go, this isn't the end of the story. We're not believing those lies anymore. Obviously, the big question is, how does he do that? How did he come down and say, it's okay now. People have lied to you and told you you'll never be loved, that you'll never be included. That's not true. Saying things doesn't often make them so. You can say a lot of things. I could say the grass is blue and the sky is green. That does not make it true. Mm -hmm. Things have to happen for them to be true. Well, what happened is 2,000 years ago, the Son of God, who was God himself, decided to come down to earth in the form of a baby to live a human life, then to live perfectly and take our punishment anyway. He chose to take all the silly things, all the ridiculous things, all the bad things we've done, and he took them with him. And where he took them was a place called the cross. The cross was one of the worst punishments the Romans could think of, and they thought of a lot of really terrible punishments. They're quite famous for it. Um, and he faced that punishment. Not just on earth, he also had God turn his back on him. He had God turn away and go, there's actually too much dirt there, too much mess. We have to deal with this first. And what happened was Jesus died. For three days, he lay in a tomb, having taken all of our mess and all of our dirt with him. And then three days later, he left that tomb. And he left it leaving all of that stuff there. He didn't take any of it back with him. It had been dealt with, it had been done. It didn't need to be here anymore. Because we didn't have to be perfect to be saved. We didn't have to have fixed it first. Jesus saved us by fixing it himself. Today, we have some baptisms, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, <laughs> and what is happening there is we are going to see a physical demonstration of Jesus on the cross dying and leaving everything behind in the grave. We are going to take Roxy, who we love, and who has chosen to believe this is true. And what we are going to do is we are going to dunk her in water, full body of water. Um, and what we are saying, what Roxy is saying, is Jesus died on the cross. He took everything into the grave and he came back clean and alive. And Roxy is saying, I believe God. He took all my sin on the cross, took it into the grave, and now I am a new creation clean. That is what she is saying. There's a lots of reasons that she's doing that. Um, and she'll tell us about them this afternoon if you come, and it'll be really exciting to hear. But one of the things she is doing is she's saying that I will no longer listen to the lies of the world. I will no longer listen to the world when it says you've done wrong things, so you are wrong. She is going to listen to God who has given her a new truth and says, you have done wrong things, I have made you right. I trust God. Why believe that? Again, I've said it. I've said a lot 
to things doesn't mean they're true. <laughs> Why? Why listen to that? Why would that be more true than what the world is saying? If we have options, what are they? Let's weigh them. Because that's important, isn't it? You have to know why you're making a choice before you make it often. So why trust God? Why trust God over the world? Well, one of the things you do when you look at the options people give you are the motivations behind the option, aren't they? Are they doing this because they love me and they know it's best for me, or are they doing it to hurt me? Well, there are aspects of the world that really do love you and do the best for you, but unfortunate truth is that often the world is trying to hurt you. The world listens to wrong things, and sometimes the best motivations in the world, they lie. Because it isn't perfect. It isn't perfect. God has one motivation and pretty much one motivation alone. He loves you. Mm. And his love matters because he is God. Um, that's pretty much the long and short of it. He, um, he is perfect in all of his ways. He um, is pure and holy and he also created all of this. If you can trust anyone's word on a creation, it's usually the creator. Um, sorry, lost where I was. Um, and that comes down to as well, who knows better? So, those girls on IG9, again, before I say this, I have forgiven them. I am vaguely in touch with a few of them. They've grown up into very wonderful women who have lovely lives and are very pleasant now. <laughs> but they were 13 year old girls. And there's a lot of things going on in 13 year old girls' lives. They are being asked what they want to do for the rest of their lives, and that's stressful. They are in school five days a week and then usually have very busy home lives. There's a lot of hormones going on. They sometimes say things that hurt. And they didn't know me very well. We spent all our times together, but they didn't get the things I referenced. I didn't get the things they referenced. We didn't know each other all that well. So, why would I hear what they were saying? What they were saying was true to them. They didn't want to be my friend. That is absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. But they were saying that no one dream wanted to be my friend. They know me. My friends who wrote this, they knew me. I spent far less time with them, bizarrely. But they actually knew who I was because they would ask me questions about it. My microphone is really falling off. <laughs> Sorry, too much hair. There we are. They, they listened to me and they loved me. What they were saying came from a motivation of love not of, we need to get this person out of our lives. <laughs> the motivation matters, and who is talking matters. I missed a verse somewhere, didn't I? <laughs> um, because, yeah, I'm going to go back to a little bit there, it doesn't matter. Uh, because, God's motivation is love. Um, and there is a verse here that shows us this. God demonstrates his love in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. That's his motivation. Um, and it isn't just the Bible that tells us that, though it tells us that lots. Um, and I am standing here using the Bible because I truly believe that it's telling us the truth, that it is God's word and that is important to hear. But also... I experienced this in my life. I have been a Christian for, oh, I don't know, since I was seven, however long ago that was, a while. <laughs> um, and I have seen this, not just on the day I became a Christian, but every day since. It also doesn't say you're going to be perfect once this happens. What it says is every day you sin, I'm going to take that away from you. We don't have to be perfect. I think as people, we often, and I am definitely guilty of this, we don't like to ask for help until we have a solution. Um, you don't want to ask your friends to help you decorate your house or move house or 
look after your pet until you've written out detailed instructions, until you've worked out exactly what you are asking for. <laughs> you can't go into this like that. Because you don't necessarily always know when you've done something wrong. You definitely don't know what you're going to do wrong tomorrow. <laughs> you just don't. It doesn't matter. It does not matter because God will take it anyway because that's what he said he'd do. Jesus is going to do all of the work. This is going to be a very short preach, I've just realised. So, near the end, that's okay. <laughs> um, the Bible tells us a lot about who God is. It tells us a lot. Um, and a lot of those words are really, really excellent. And um, God shows us those in our daily lives. Um, God is, do you want the next one, Kate? Cheers. God is our creator. Both of us individually, us as a nation, us as a world. God has created every little aspect. He's loving. We've seen that. His motivation is love. Um, he is love personified in a lot of the descriptions of himself. He's also, so he's a trinity, there's three in one, and different elements of God are different good things for us. <laughs> he's a good father, God the father. He loves you. There are verses that tell us that he's a good father who loves to lavish gifts on his children. The best gift he gives us is his forgiveness, is his salvation. He is our saviour. Jesus Christ sent down from heaven by his Father to take on the sins of the world. He is reigning in heaven. He is alive again forever, sat at the right hand of the Father. He has control over everything he has made. He lives with us. When Jesus went back up to heaven, he gave us a helper called the Holy Spirit who, once you are a Christian, lives in you forever and lives with you. He is holy and pure. It's the only way he could pay that price for us. Never once sinned, never once separated from God, never once made a mistake or said something silly that he regretted in the car later. <laughs> and he is merciful and gracious. He is forgiving to insane lengths. There is absolutely nothing that could be done that he couldn't find forgiveness for. So the first step really is do you believe that about God? Do you believe that? I do. I do. I can hands down say that I believe every part of that about God. Because when you believe that about God, it changes what you believe about yourself. It welcomes you in to a new reality. It undoes some of the lies the world has told you and it keeps undoing them until it has undone them all. It doesn't stop. Once you have accepted that that is true about God, it's really hard to change your mind about it. Because when you believe this about God, it changes us because we become... Okay, next slide. It's all right. Because <laughs> we become a new creation. We become loved. Again, to giddying extremes. We become so overwhelmingly loved and we get taken into a new family. We are adopted. We have a new heavenly father and we have family. We are saved. We're saved from everything that separated us. We're saved from every mistake we make. We're saved from a lot of really horrible things. We're saved from death. We also, and this is a fairly complicated one, we become co-heirs. So when we're adopted, we get taken into that family and we are true children of that family. So we get 
the same deal that Jesus gets. We get to sit with him in heaven forever. We get eternity with him. We get complete salvation. We get to become absolutely blameless before God. It's as if we never did anything wrong. We're clean. We are supported and never alone. The Holy Spirit's with us. You actually can't be alone anymore. You are never... (laughs) You're supported in everything you do. Any mistake you make, you're not making it on your own. There's someone there to help you fix it. Anything good that happens, you're not celebrating on your own. Someone's there to celebrate with you. You're forgiven of everything. And you are chosen. God looked down and saw you and thought, that one. I want that one. They're coming with me. They're part of my family. So why is this important? Why is that important? Why not go on believing the lies of the world? Why not go on muddling your way through? No one will ever truly accept me, but that's okay. They'll accept bits of me and I'll accept bits of them. It's fine, it's a deal we all make. Why not carry on like that? Because that decision doesn't actually just end here. It doesn't just end here. We're not here really to talk about our daily lives. That's important. And God has a lot of things that he has to say about our daily lives. He doesn't leave us on our own in them. But that's not the end of the story. Actually, this has implications forever. Because the sad truth is that those sins and silly mistakes, they're not just silly mistakes. They leave us separated from God. And they leave us separated from him forever. The unfortunate truth is that if you're not in heaven, you're in hell. A place of eternal separation from God. A God free from all things, goodness flows. And if goodness isn't flowing from him where you are, then there is no goodness. And that's not a nice place to be. Um, Yeah. Because the lies of the world don't just stick with us in this world. They can go with us to the next. And that's not a place anyone really wants to be, I don't think. But it's okay, because God has given us another option. He's gone, we're not sticking with those lies. We're not sticking with them. My friends in the letter, they started the letter with, they want to be your friends because, and they ended with, friends forever. (laughs) God starts his letter to us like that. He starts with, I want to love you. And he ends with, and I will love you forever. It's not going to end. We get to be all of these things forever. And all of this can be true. It's true for, I know, a great number of people in this room. If you have never said yes to God, then not all of these things are true about you yet. He does love you. He really does. He sent his son for you. But you're not yet a new creation. You're not yet saved into his family. You're not yet receiving the gift of eternal life. There are opportunities to say yes to that. There is a reason that a lot of Christians do similar things. Most of us go to church on Sundays. Uh, Most of us will go to baptisms and do Holy Communion and most of us might stay away from excessive alcohol use or this or that. And there's reasons for that. God's asked us nicely (laughs) and we like him so we said yes. Um, That isn't how we get saved, let me be very clear on this. That is not why we are saved, that is not why we are Christians. Why we are Christians is because of what we've sung this morning. Because God is good. That is why we are Christians. There's a lot of things we can do after we're Christians that are nice and that are good. But they're for later. Actually, for any of this to be true, all you have to do is believe the first lot of words. That's 
actually all you have to do, really. All you have to do is go, oh God, I actually see who you are. And I see that you love me and I would like to be loved by you. Sorry that you have to die for me. <laughs> That's all you have to say. Sorry that you have to because I made mistakes. And I see that I made mistakes and I don't really want to make them anymore, but you are good. That's actually all God asks of us. I didn't write the verse down. <laughs> I can't remember it. Um, there are a number of verses where it says like this, basically. Um, Jesus, in fact, tells us, that's the verse. <laughs> uh, Jesus, in fact, tells us that the only way to the Father is through him. Nothing you do will ever be good or bad enough to really affect this. Either way, you can't be so bad God will never forgive for you, and you can't be so God good God doesn't have to. Jesus said there is a route, there is a path, and it is through him. All of us will be at different points in this journey. If you are a Christian, you know that, you know you believe that first lot of words about God, but you're not entirely sure about the second lot. You're not entirely sure that you are definitely saved. You know God died for you, but like, really? That's okay. What we can do is we can start thinking about what those words mean that God tells us. We can start thinking about what those words mean because if you actually believe them, there isn't an exception for you. <laughs> You're loved anyway. It's true. Like Ruth was saying this morning, what's true is true. does not matter what you feel. It is true. Um, and we can think on that and you can pray on it. And we're going to sing a song in a few minutes. Um, and that's what we can start doing. We can start thinking about who God is and therefore who I am. If you don't yet believe those words about God, maybe start asking, what would it take for me to believe them? What would God have to show me for that to be true? What more would I have to hear? What evidence is there to and for? I don't know how your brain works. You might be a very analytical person and you need to do a pros and cons list. That's fine, do a pros and cons list. Maybe you're a very emotive person and what needs to happen is for you to hear a song and start crying and go, oh, I actually understand these words now. That's fine, you listen to a song and you start crying. God is gonna to talk to you how God talks to you. But start asking, if God is real, if God is real, and he loves me, and he was willing to do that for me, what would it take for me to listen to him? You don't even have to say, so God is real, this. You can literally say, if, if God was real, if these weird people stood at the front of a school room and not talking absolute garbage, <laughs> what would that look like? And if you believe all of it, excellent, lovely, I'll see you in heaven. <laughs> um, yeah, really short preach. The band would like to come up. <laughs> I will pray. Um, if you want to join me, it doesn't matter where you are in that journey. It doesn't matter what you're believing right now. If you want to join me, you join me. If it's the first time you've done it, if it's the 6,000th time you've done it, please join me. We're going to sing a song that is very similar to the other ones we've sung today. It tells us that Jesus died for us and that that's a good thing. Join in if you'd like. Listen if you'd like. But please, if you pray that prayer for the first time, um, there's a big youth festival uh, called New Day and um, every year they do a night where they do this call and response thing and they get the people to run to the front. I'm not going to ask you to do that. It would look kind of weird. Um, there's not 6,000 dollars in here running. Um, and that might be a little bit scary. But the, one of the reasons they do that is because sometimes when you respond to things like this, an action is good. It draws a line in your brain. You say, on this day I stood up. Or on this day I did this. And it helps us. We're very physical people, aren't we? It helps us if we have a story. 
So if you pray this prayer with me, either out loud or in your heart, please turn to the person next to you and say, I just prayed that. Please do something that tells us. Oh, we'd like to welcome you into our family. And we'd be really, really excited to hear you heard prayed this prayer. But also, it gives, creates a moment in your mind when you go, on this day I did this. Thank you, Father God, that you are a good God. Thank you, Father God, that you are loving and kind and forgiving. And that one day you sent your son down to die for my sins. I'm sorry that you have to do that, that I make mistakes. I'd like to turn away from those mistakes now and believe what you say about yourself and believe what you say about me. <coughs> Amen. Um, Phil, if you like to use that, we're going to sing When I Survey.
there is nothing that we could do, have done, will do, that could ever earn or deserve the favour that we have found in your eyes. Thank you for the reminder this morning from our times of worship and from, from Beth of how much you love us, that you loved us unto death, that we owed a debt that we could never pay back, so you paid it for us instead. You allowed yourself in the form of a man to be nailed to a cross, to take upon yourself the punishment that was due to us. And then as Beth said, on the third day you rose again. You defeated death, you defeated the consequence of the sin. And now we get to reign victorious with you as co-heirs in Christ, as co-inheritors, as part of our family, as Beth said. We are people who are loved and cherished and redeemed and justified and made whole. We are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. Hallelujah. Thank you. I thank you, God, that I can say that of myself. space that you would continue to speak to us this week. May we never move on from the cross. May we never move on from how much you love us. And that we would live lives in glory and honour of you always. seats where they are. Thank you so much for coming along this morning. Thank you particularly if you are a, uh, a guest with us. We really do hope we get to see you again sometime if you're on holiday um, or if you're just visiting. It would be great to be able to see you in the future at some point. Um, go in peace to love and serve the Lord, as my father would say. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to be together this morning. Um, do you remember 4pm, uh, Roxy's baptism at the Shakespeare Centre for all those who are around.